is virtually absolved of all blame for the American Revolution. He is instead portrayed as a much maligned monarch who did nothing more than support the decisions of his ministers and parliament. It's certainly true that George III had little responsibility for British policy before the Boston Tea Party. Thereafter, his role was far from passive. Indeed, he's genuinely interesting. He became the leading proponent of punishing the 13 colonies and the main driving force of the British war for America. George III became actively committed to a policy of coercion because he believed that compromise would be interpreted as a sign of weakness by the colonies. He saw the struggle as a fundamental defense of law and order. In September 1774, months before the outbreak of fighting, he concluded, the die is now cast. The colonists must either submit or triumph. He thought advice of caution the most absurd that can be suggested and believed that there was no longer any choice. We must either master them or totally leave them and treat them as aliens. George III's views were increasingly more hardline than those of his prime minister and at odds with opposition leaders. Lord North, the prime minister, favored a gesture of conciliation but the king did not. The divergence of the king's views and those of the opposition party were even more extreme. Edmund Burke and William Pitt made some of the best orations of their political careers in favor of a peaceful settlement in 1775. There was even growing public disaffection against the war with a profusion of anti-war petitions coming from towns throughout Britain. George III ignored all colonial requests to be a mediator. He refused to receive petitions sympathetic to America, including that written by conservatives in Congress known as the Olive Branch Petition, really the last serious effort made at compromise by Congress. 
it was only at this stage that uh, he became an object of criticism in America. Until then, Congress was still toasting the health of the king in their early meetings. And it was Jefferson who penned the first overt attack on George III, which played incidentally a major role in his selection as the drafter of the Declaration of Independence. It was called a summary view of the rights of British America. One English professor recently, a professor of English literature, has called it telling off the king. <laughs> George III, in fact, was crucial in prolonging the war, which became a personal crusade. The present contest with America, I cannot help seeing, is the most serious in which any country was ever engaged. He equated opposition to the war with virtual treason. He ridiculed opposition leaders like William Pitt, who supposed the Americans poor, mild persons, who after unheard of and repeated grievances, had no choice but slavery or the sword. He accused the opponents of abetting the enemy. He was more than simply committed to the cause, but became the chief driving force of the war, owing to the void of leadership created by the Prime Minister, Lord North. The latter was a man of considerable ability, but he was unsuited to being a war leader. He was no Winston Churchill. Furthermore, North increasingly lacked conviction in the cause and was increasingly despondent. He still hoped for a negotiated peace with America. Indeed, North con constantly asked to resign from office. He believed his continuance in office an obstacle to any chance of a negotiated peace with America. He and his ministers were too associated with the policy of coercion. He pleaded with the king that capital punishment itself was better than staying in office. But the king was unwilling to let him resign since the opposition leaders were committed to American independence as early as 1778. That's almost five years before America became independent. George III became so worried and distrustful of his wobbling prime minister that he began to monitor him through two junior ministers who acted as virtual spies on the prime minister. North's motives for remaining in power are complex. One of the reasons the Prime Minister remained in power is he felt a moral obligation to George III. George III had been his childhood friend. And in fact, North's father was George III's tutor. The King had rescued him, perhaps more importantly, from financial bankruptcy. North regarded himself, quote, under such obligations to the King that I can never leave his service while well, he desires me to remain in it and thinks I can be of use to him. North said he literally felt tied to the state. His quandary was made even more difficult by the king's threat to abdicate if North was to leave office, which would create a constitutional crisis. So North remained on board, but who was driving? George III declaimed, if others will not be active, I must drive. George III, by dint of a forceful personality and pertinacity, kept the government together throughout the closing months of 1779. He bolstered his ministers against the brilliant opposition leaders like Charles James Fox, Edmund Burke, and Lord Shelburne. He rallied the cabinet to face a growing international threat. In June of 1779, Britain faced the danger of a combined invasion by the fleets of France and Spain. There was a virtual stalemate in the war in America. The government majorities were dwindling in the House of Commons. The cabinet was divided. And if there's one point in the American Revolution where I'd like to be the fly on the wall, it was this point, uh, really the point where the king takes the bridle of his power. And he, in the summer of 1779, summons the entire cabinet to what is now Buckingham Palace what was then uh, a house called the Queen's House. He asked them to come in the library. This is the first time any reigning monarch has done this since the reign of Queen Anne at the beginning of the century. He tells them to sit down, which is a breach of normal protocol. Lord George Germain, the last British Secretary of State for America, said that we began to think we were going to be dismissed. And very probably they all thought the same thing but it was really a pep talk to keep the government together. 
and not at all too absurd at this point, is playing the role of, of his own prime minister. Lord North continued on the brink of resignation, which increasingly left the initiative to the king. George III goes into a sort of martial mode at this point, with Churchillian-like speeches. He would never surrender, but march on whilst any ten men in the kingdom will stand by me. He admitted the times are certainly hazardous, but that ought to rouse the spirit of every Englishman to support me. He called for sacrifice. We must stretch every nerve to defend ourselves and must run some risks, for if we are to play only a cautious game, ruin will inevitably ensue. He enlisted his 14-year-old son, Prince William, into the Navy, and he changed his favorite royal retreat from a small modest house in Kew to a castle, Windsor Castle. The parliamentary opposition was in no doubt about who was the driving force behind the war, and they switched their tactics accordingly to demonstrate against the king personally. This is a very new movement to actually criticize the king directly. And in April of 1780, a motion passed in the House of Commons that the power of the king has increased, is increasing, and ought to be diminished. It was a major defeat for the king and some government members supported it. The position the, of the king and the cabinet had become desperate as they faced the united opposition and dwindling majorities in Parliament. But the hand of fate rescued the king. The fortunes of war began to improve, supporting his contention that victory was possible. His optimism was never entirely misplaced because it was never a war of constant reversals and defeats. This was especially true of the year 1780. In April of 1780, the British narrowly missed defeating the French fleet in the Caribbean. In May, the Americans suffered the greatest defeat of the war when the British received the surrender of an army of 5,000 men in the port of Charleston in South Carolina. In August, Lord Cornwallis defeated Horatio Gates, the victor of Saratoga at the Battle of Camden. In September, Benedict Arnold defected from his command at West Point to join the British. The king was vindicated. His fortunes abroad were matched by the troubles of the opposition at home. Their support dwindled in reaction to the Gordon Riot in London when 800 people died in six days of rioting. The crowds released the inmates in Burn Newgate Prison in scenes that would be reminiscent of the opening of the French Revolution. George III's fixation at winning at all costs reached an absurd level with the British defeat at Yorktown. He was unbowed. He regarded it as a temporary setback like Saratoga. He was ready to continue. He was confident of parliamentary support. He was mortified when Lord North finally made clear his intention to resign. North finally spoke out, explaining that his position was no longer tenable and that no longer did he command majorities in the House of Commons. He told the king, Your Majesty is well apprised that in this country the prince on the throne cannot with prudence oppose the deliberate resolution of the House of Commons. Parliament had altered its sentiments, and their sentiments, whether just or erroneous, must ultimately prevail. Your Majesty, having persevered as long as possible in what you thought right, can lose no honor if you yield at length, as some of the most renowned and most glorious of your predecessors have done to the opinion and wishes of the House of Commons. The King remained stubborn. If you resign before I've decided what I'll do, you will certainly forever forfeit my regard. When he was forced to yield to the inevitable, George III drafted his abdication speech. The abdication was never submitted. When he was asked the following year whether he would be willing to receive an ambassador from the United States, he replied, I certainly can never say that we, it will be agreeable to me, and I shall have a very bad opinion of any Englishman that can accept being sent a minister for a revolted state, and which certainly for many years cannot have a stable government. George III had tried to console himself over the loss of America. I should be miserable indeed if I did not blame, if I feel that no blame on that account can be laid on my door. And I did not know also that knavery seems to be so much the striking feature of its inhabitants 
that it may not in the end be an evil that they become aliens to this kingdom. He gave a fitting, if somewhat fanciful, epitaph to his own role in the American Revolution during that emotional meeting with John Adams in 1785. I wish you, sir, to believe that it may be understood in America that I've done nothing in the late contest but what I thought myself indispensably bound to do by the duty which I owed my people. I will be frank with you. I was the last to consent to the separation, but the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I have always said, as I now say, that I would be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. George III perhaps understood better than many of his aristocratic opponents the portent of the American Revolution to the end of the Ancien Regime in Europe. He was aware of the revolutionary forces of change. He was unapologetically defending an order of monarchy, a state church, hierarchy, and empire that he regarded as the world turned the right way up. Jefferson had the measure of the man whose values were anathema to his own. <laughs>